This morning we're going towards small x, and uh, the first speaker is Roger Vinagopalan, who will peer into the infrared with Stalin Plus. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, I was preparing this talk, I was, um, I well, initially I didn't appreciate where the first audience is going to be, so my goal was to have at least one slide that almost everybody has seen uh, in one of my talks or in one of the previous talks. And at least one slide that no one has seen. Uh, so I'm, I'm um, going to have some introductory material, um, which is fairly general and, and uh, it's been discussed previously by a lot of people. Um, and that's, um, that's about physics and the raging limit, in particular, muon saturation, which uh, I rather use a natural phenomenon uh, in that limit of QCB. Uh, so the raging limit is a limit of very small momentum transitions and very high energies, so small x. Uh, and, uh, so, and then I'm going to talk about a theory framework for muon saturation. And then I'm going to dive in and do an outline, a very specific calculation. Um, and that's producing photons and deaths um, from the CDC. Uh, and in particular, I'm going to comment on some enormous simplicities in unit higher order computations um, that I will illustrate with this specific example that is what I believe to be the right way to do higher order computations um, CDC. And so this is going to be very uh, hands-on and then I'm going to take the liberty of speculating on some interesting uh, recent, recent developments and this is work where um, there have been many sort of connections that I've been able to sort of see but I haven't yet been able to put them all together. Uh, but I hope at least it will uh, jog your interest, even if not complete. So, um, so one thing we realized, uh, and this is a slide that probably in some version many of you have seen. Uh, I particularly like this because it really illustrates the, really do the dominance of muons and C quarks as you go to small x or towards the regular limit. Uh, and, and so the, the key lesson is that and you go to very high energies configurations, which have lots of gluons and C quarks dominate the full time wave function. So, in very high energy scattering processes, clock state configurations, which contain lots of gluons and C quarks dominate the wave functions. Uh, so, another way to think about this picture uh, at the initio. Uh, and so you, you all have seen this picture. So what does this really mean? And what does this language mean? Um, I can't change the slide now, but I'll wait. You so let me just talk. So, so the question is, what does this really mean? Uh, and one can illustrate that in, in um, a very simple kind of part on model picture of an hadron. Uh, Oh, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Where, um, so you can think of the proton as, you know, at, at say minus infinity is containing three balanced quarks. And then as you boost the proton, so it's, it's of course dressed by quantum fluctuations, which are, you know, fluctuations of the vacuum around the balanced quarks uh, that are short lived. And so they're exchanged between these balanced quarks. They, they make up perhaps the constituent picture of your hadron at low energies. Uh, and then as you boost the, the hadron to high energies, what happens is that these, these short-lived configurations live longer and longer. And so if you were to probe this at very high energies, at very short time scales, so at relatively high Q squares, uh, what you're going to see is a large number of these gluons and then C quarks that are embedded from these. And that's the underlying message behind this picture. So it's a very simple uh, and very, um, self-evident in retrospect picture of the parton model uh, with, with the basic message that we parton fluctuations are time dilated in strong interaction time scales uh, in hadron wave functions. Uh, these long-lived gluons can radiate 
copious numbers of further small excluders. And so the question that has been posed uh, is whether, uh, you know, you can think of this. Oh, oh thank you so much. So the question that has been posed is, is you know, if this proliferation will go on endlessly, right? Uh, can we sort of keep boosting to higher, higher energies and produce more and more? And so it is, is this sort of like a runaway uh, uh, popcorn machine which is sort of threatening to burst the lid of the proton? Now, um, within QCD, <coughs> it's clear that, um, well, I mean, this is something that would threaten the stability of matter, this is where allowed to go on indefinitely. Uh, and so the question is how, is there a way within QC itself uh, through its interactions that this is regulated? And as you can anticipate, the answer is yes. Uh, and the way it, it does it is that as you produce more and more of these protons, we look the proton head on in the transverse uh, space of the proton. Uh, you find that this, you know, these gluons start to proliferate and at some point they start to become close packed. Uh, in the transfer space space of the proton. And gluons are very different from photons. They self-interact, they carry color charge. And because of that, they are, they are in addition to the tendency for them to branch travel for the gluons, uh, they also have recombinant strong screening interactions. And there's, there's a competition between the two, the tendency for gluons to produce more gluons uh, and, and, and proliferate. And at the same time, when the occupancies get very large, where they're sort of near to each other in phase space, then they could recombine or screen each other. So both of these processes are going on, which then leads to some kind of a saturation of the one density. So what that means is that as you go to higher and higher energy, it's not that you don't add more and more gluons, it's just that you add smaller and smaller gluons, which have a screening, color screening radius in the order of the emergency scale. And this emergent scale is, is something that is really something that is not a Lagrangian. It's not something you look at the Lagrangian theory and say, oh, this is this emergent scale. Neither is lambda QCD, by the way. But you can think of lambda QCD and this very strong interact, strongly interacting dynamics as generating an emergent scale, which is, has as basis the fundamental scale of theory, which leads to a very rapid growth of this emergent scale with uh, energy. Uh, and so this can, in the radio limit, become a really large scale in the problem. Okay, so, and it can be much larger than lambda QCD. So this is truly remarkable, if true, because this tells us that one is encountering a regime of QCD where the physics is weakly coupled because asymptotic freedom applies <coughs> in coupling the Runner's function of this very large scale. But at the same time, the occupancies are huge. So it's a strongly interacting uh, theory. So you have a many body strongly interacting theory that's weakly coupled. And that's very rare that one has uh, such access. So in principle, at least asymptotically, one can study the infrared properties of theory in this limit uh, in weak coupling. <coughs> so here's what it looks like. And this is a plot some of you might have seen um, earlier uh, in the week. Uh, it's from a report that Elka and I and, and several others put out, uh, Salvatore as well here, uh, where it's, it's, the, it's the Q squared versus parton density plot. And so as you go to, this is going to smaller x, this is going to higher resolutions. So when you're very small x, again, the Regia limit, and so this is sort of the old Regia physics of pomerons and Regions. So these are non-perturbative exchanges that we still don't fully understand. We know they're stringing in nature, uh, but, but these are sort of, they describe the properties of total cross sections, but we never really fully understood uh, what really constitutes these objects. Uh, but then what we're doing when going to high energies, uh, not just small x, thereby increasing the resolution, is you're starting to open up this window that I mentioned where you have emergent scales which are weakly coupled, and one can try and understand the physics in this regime where the field strengths are very large, um, uh, but uh, the coupling is weak. So it's a strongly interacting quark muon matter, um, but it's weakly coupled. So here, in principle, is a window to understand 
some of the deep, deepest questions in, in QCD. Uh, and the question we all would like to answer is whether one can take the understanding of the game into right here and try and understand the existence. And, and also, can we move, if you can construct effective field theories which work in this regime here, can we move out in this regime and map to the physics that we understand from perturbative QCD? So is there, so if you do the usual conventional linear factorization of perturbative QCD, and some of those physics of TMDs, um, can they match in this regime here uh, the physics that uh, you get from studying the couple dynamics here. And you'll hear a talk from Fang Yuan tomorrow uh, where he will actually show that, that small x TMDs uh, can be understood <coughs> within uh, this kind of framework. So, um, so before I get to the, the formal theoretical description, um, a lot of the motivation for saturation can be encapsulated in a very simple picture of elastic scattering where in the high energy limit, to show the dominant configurations uh, into which an electron fluctuates are that of an electron in a virtual photon splits into quark and quark pair, uh, where the quark carries a long show fraction z of the momentum of the virtual photon, and one minus z is carried by the anti-quark, uh, while the quark and the anti-quark have a transfer separation r perp, which loosely is inversely proportional to the the virtuality of the process keeps required. And so you can write the virtual photon proton cross section of either transversely longely polarized virtual photons as a convolution over this transverse um, um, spatial integral uh, and this momentum fraction here times, uh, uh, times the probability of this virtual photon to split. Uh, into a quark anti quark pair, so that's this. So you can compute this from the QED polarization tensor. Uh, and, that, and then that's convoluted with the probability for this quark anti quark pair to scatter on the proton. Okay. And so in, in this rewriting, this cross section here, this so called dipole cross section, is a function of the transfer size and the x, the Bjorkian x um, of, the, of the scattering process. And there's a very simple model which was um, uh, developed very shortly <laughs> after Kara came online. Uh, it's the Golik Vienna Gustav model, uh, which, which is it's a very simple model, but it captures some of the essence of this physics, uh, which is you could you could parameterize this quark anti quark proton cross section as some some constant, non perturbative constant. Uh, cross-section time, times one minus exponential of r perp squared times two r squared. So when r perp is very small compared to this saturation scale here, which goes as one or x to some power in this parameterization, uh, when r perp is much, when this product is much smaller than one, when you have very small dipoles, you have a phenomenon of color transparency. So essentially the cross-section is very small and it's proportional to the size of the dipole squared, and so essentially very small size dipoles are removed without interacting. On the other hand, if our purpose is, is larger than one or two s, so if this is smart, then you can ignore this exponent, and then the dipole interacts with, with a very large cross section. Now, the physics of saturation is seen in the fact that the QS, where if you ever imagine the QS were to become a large semi hard scale, then you're seeing hadronic sized cross sections in deep plastic scattering, even though the size of the dipoles are small. Okay, so that's really the physics is that the density of gluons that the virtual, the, the QQ bar pair is scattering off is so large that it's interacting with those, even though it's still very small, with hadron sized cross sections. And there are more sophisticated versions of this model, and the uh, can be shown to give excellent fits to all the pair of small x data. Um, it's not just the inclusive data, but diffractive and exclusive data uh, at, at small x. And you can extract the saturation scale from these, and then by just doing, you know, looking, putting in the nuclear geometry and so on, you can, you can extrapolate what the scale, the scale would be. 
Uh, and, and the issue with the HERA uh, description, saturation description, is that the scales that you extract are, are not much larger than the scales than the truly intrinsically non-perturbative scale. So you get something which you know, is in this range here. Uh, depending on the X values probe. So it's not a really truly semi-hard scale. Uh, and the promise of EIC, especially for nuclei, um, is that you can get to larger values of scale where you're really starting to enter the perturbative region. Now people often ask this question, you know, what, what QS is large or small? And, and perturbative QCD, when you do first principles calculations, that's not really necessarily a well-defined question. It really depends on the process that you're calculating. And it depends on how the coupling would run as a function of the scale. So to give you an example, when people do, say, finite temperature QCD calculations, <coughs> uh, the temperature, uh, when you have temperatures of, say, 1 GV, then the coupling is actually relatively weak. You can do weakly coupled calculations. Now, these are not just strictly perturbative calculations. You can do these summations and so on. And it turns out that for many processes, you can compute very high order, very good precision, and compared to lies, for instance. Uh, but that's generically true. So these are scheme-dependent, scale-dependent questions. Uh, so there's no, it really depends on what process you're looking at uh, when you decide you know, whether the scale is large or small. Now the nuclei come into the picture because as you go to very high energies, essentially the virtual photon is coherently interacting with partons from different nuclei simultaneously. Uh, so it can't resolve the front or the back end of the nucleus as its, its path through the nucleus. And so naturally, the, the fluctuations that it sees as it encounters color to its path gives it a sort of random walk kind of field strength squared. Uh, and that can be represented in terms of the saturation scale squared going in proportional to 8 to the one third times that in the proton. And so that's what gives you this additional oomph that one sees when one goes large nuclei at high energies. Then one gets a larger scale where one could conceivably do these weak coupling calculations that, that can make quantitative comparisons in principle possible in theory and experiment. And, and some of these observables have dramatic um, effects, um, uh, respond dramatically to large saturation scales. And the reason is that the saturation scale appears in the exponent, as I mentioned, that simple model that I illustrated, uh, where you could write the dipole cross section as one minus exponent of the saturation scale over the transfer size, which I have simply replaced by Q squared here. And there are exclusive cross sections, for instance, where this is proportional to the square of this one minus exponent. So if you have a, a large saturation scale here, if you increase it by you know, a little bit, it's exponential, you can see very significant changes in cross sections as you vary this Q squared. So in particular, if you were to measure exclusive or diffractive cross sections, you can see very striking systematics uh, as you vary nuclear size in Q squared. Um, and, and this would really be a reflection of the nonlinear character of QCD being manifest. You have to see coherent scattering of strong gauge fields. Um, and, and some of this uh, can, has been discussed further in a sort of a relatively simple way, I hope, uh, in a recent paper by Hickey Mansari and myself. This, so yeah. you see the do no because here I sign this one factor and you see the variation and yet when you're measuring something or calculating something, there are other factors in there which are also varying. Sure. I mean so so you, so there are so okay, so one can of course you can compute realistic dipole cross sections and so on, putting in all the, 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 the physics in. And you see that some of the simple qualitative systematics actually do persist because they're so strong. The yeah. dependencies are so strong in, in A. So I'd like to see yeah. some physical process where you know. So so actually this paper is written in both in response to a question you asked, and I actually sent you this paper to, to read. And so you would thank you for prompting us for okay, asking this you question. Went on, uh, you <laughs> went on points, but I still have a question. <laughs> but but the, the, so the systematics as we showed in that paper, and actually no, I'm I'm I'm, I'm um, only partly kidding because we were motivated to show 
that these dependencies are really quite strong. So, for example, in the coherent cross sections, you a squared, the coherent ones say four thirds, and so on. <coughs> also, Q squared, you see very strong dependencies as you go from above or below Q or QS. So, if you were to see very strong dependencies and uh, you know of this nature, I think that would uh, uh, and, and there are also more detailed calculations to back it up. I mean, of course, they all can be proved significantly. So. Um, in particular, with diffractive cross sections, as you know, there are really fundamental issues that are still in scope of the And um, it's a little unclear how exactly they impact these. Um, so, anyway, so this is the, uh, so that was kind of the preliminaries to uh, say, okay, is there a framework where one can formulate some of these questions? And so, um, as, as I mentioned, that at the very high energies, you, um, the, the proton, the fluctuations of the proton clock states, which contain large numbers of gluons, are what dominate multiparticle induction. And so, rather than cons considering all possible clock states, um, it's, it's much more sensible to look at those that are dominated by a large number of gluons to see if you can construct an effective theory for those. Uh, and, and just Looking at the hair data already provides some motivation, uh, and this is somewhat uh, some of our original motivation uh, in constructing this. But was looking at the data where you see that the balanced quark modes are really concentrated at large x, and they really fall off precipitously at <coughs> small x. But you want to see quarks are really dominating at small x. So, so I didn't answer that question in the previous slide. I'm still yeah. Yeah, so if, if you look at color transparency, so of course, in the end, deep is scattering, we have that consistency of color transparency, perfect made dominant and, and deep But <laughs> if you look at color transparency the other way around, the problem is always you also don't know how long it takes from all the evolution from a small size to a large size. And that's always one of the unknowns when we look at color transparency, the deep exclusive right. right. We have the same the other way around, that there's this uncertainty how long, when it starts appearing. Because in some of your models, you have to assume. No, so, so, so I, I think you better have the color transparency limit than any. any that I agree. Yeah. Built in. But some so, of the progress, when it appears and it disappears, there's a time constant there that we don't know anything about. It's, 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 evolution it's, part it's, it's, yeah, so, so, so that's what these evolution equations I'm going to describe too. Oh, no wait, that's precisely actually what they do. So, this is a very <laughs> simple model representation of that, but there are actually. So there are more sophisticated models that come out of the framework that we have discussed that actually do precisely this. No, so they just understand. This is the simple model yeah. now, but there's more complications. So, okay, fine, I'll wait. This is just a yeah. uh, sort of a, yeah. a mousse bouche, as they say. Um, a mousse bouche. Yeah, okay, so, um, so, so what I'm going to argue is that this simple picture here between Balance modes, which are localized at large x, and D modes at small x, with, with these being dynamical degrees of freedom, and these being static degrees of freedom, um, are actually something that you can formalize in effective deep theory. So there's a kind of von Oppenheimer kind of separation um, between these modes and uh, these large x modes and small x modes, uh, which, um, which I will describe in, this, in a second. Uh, and, and, but then you can ask, okay, well, what separates, you know, where you call large x and small x? And, and you can sort of put in some boundary between the two, which I call lambda plus, between large x and small x. And so, of course, the physics that you describe shouldn't depend on what, you, what the separation that you propose. And that's precisely what leads to minimization group equations, just as in the picture of the QC. So same, precisely the same logic. <coughs> And so what is this effective field theory of life for? And so, uh, so it turns out that there's a remarkable isomorphism uh, that was noticed as back as the late 60s by Susskind, uh, and Halper, uh, based on some work that Weinberg did on, on, uh, on finding the diagrams of high energies, um, where he, they saw that there's an exact isomorphism between the Poincare group on the life firm and the Galilean subgroup of two-dimensional quantum mechanics. So this sounds very fancy. But you can see that in just this usual free particle dispersion relation, uh, where you would write e squared is p squared plus 2m uh, in terms of these light front coordinates, p minus and p plus and p per, uh, it can be rewritten as p minus is p per squared over p plus. 
And so if you interpret P minus as your energy, so the generator of translations in X plus the Lyapunov time, uh, then you could think of P plus um, as mass and, and P perp as momenta. And so small masses correspond to small X and large masses correspond to large X. So that this really maps onto a heavy quark vector theory kind of description where you integrate out heavy quark. Now, of course, um, you don't integrate on them completely because these color charges carry color. Uh, and so that is the significant complication in, in implementing this. So, um, but to summarize, the large X modes are static light for color sources. Uh, the heavy masses of the light, for, light cone. Uh, and they're represented by some color charge density, a color array. And the small X modes are dynamical fields, which used to be masses of HP. <coughs> so one can, with this intuition, one can construct a coarse grain many body of P in the right front, where the large X modes are represented in the path integral by integral or color charge densities. Um, so you can show that if you have a large uh, higher dimensional representation of SU3, you can write that in terms of this classical path integral of color. Uh, and then there's these dynamical gauge fields. And so you have a weight function now. This is a density matrix. So this is not just a one body density matrix. It's, it's a density matrix with higher uh, wave function. <laughs> uh, and so that is a weight functional. It's a functional role. So it's not a function. Uh, and it's, it's defined at some scale lambda plus. So this contains all the non perturbative information at large x at this scale here. Uh, and then, and then here you have so that's the distribution of color sources, and then you have a gauge field which depends, which is coupled. So you have these rows <coughs> coupled to gauge fields in gauge invariant way, and then whatever operator that you're computing is is then represented as a functional of row in A. So the way you think about this is that you have to think about these being since these are static sources, there's no back reaction on the large X sources. So this is really like a spin glass in that sense. Okay, so you have these stochastic um, configurations where each configuration you, you, you perform this calculation and then average over all, all possible distributions to the left and point to that. And this object is a non perturbative gauge invariant density matrix. It is your core object, it is sort of a master uh, object in the theory, which contains all the non trivial information that you'd like to learn about QCD. And the evolution of this, so there are renormalization group equations now. So the requirement that this all be independent of this lambda separating the sources and fields is what gives you renormalization group equations that describe the evolution. Yeah, and these are these Jim Wilk and BK equations I'll describe in a second. So now let's come back to the dipole scattering that we mentioned. So again, you can always write down this decomposition in this form, the high -need limit. Um, and so when it's now this dipole cross-section can be absent, so this is your operator that I mentioned. And so that's represented in terms of this weight functional times your T matrix. And the T matrix is one minus the S matrix, where the S matrix in the high energy limit can be written in terms of a trace of Wilson lines having to do with the multiple scattering of the spark antiquark pair of the shock wave, which is your nucleus. So this is an iconal picture where you think of these, these, these quark antiquark pairs being color rotated by the gluons that are in the shock wave that's represented by this kind of expression here. And so um, imposing that the operator be independent of this cutoff uh, leads to the following renormalization equation. So this is the change in this, in this dipole cross section, or in this case, the S matrix which is a trace of these Wilson lines, as you change rapidity. And that can be represented as this, as this very non-local, non-linear equation, where the two-point correlator of Wilson lines can be written in terms of something on the right-hand side, which is a kernel times a two-point correlator minus a trace of the, the product of traces of these two-point correlators at some intermediate point Z, representing the emitted part down here. Um, and uh, this is then average or this weight functional problem. Okay. Now, 
in the limit of in, in at large MC and for a large nucleus, so this is a large nucleus, you can factorize this this um, this average over the product of these traces into the product of averages. And then this equation gets a closed form expression. And so so now our chairman can look up because this is the, the famed Bosky Cuff Jacob. Um, and it's uh, widely used in phenological applications. Um, so it's been a very powerful tool in this field. And it's really remarkable that we have this very simple nonlinear equation of energy. It turns out that there's, there's a very profound and interesting connection. Wow. Okay. I thought you were going to give me extra time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I'm, I'm not going to talk about your stuff anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, you know, I, I was saying nice things. things. <laughs> nice things. <laughs> minutes. Okay, I'll cut short my nice things. So there's 10 minutes. I do go in nine. You okay. already lost to them. Uh, so, so um, okay, let me just mention uh, that <coughs> the EFKL equation, which is the leading law of equation, which is key, can be obtained by just doing a low density expansion of these color charges from the decay equation. So, you do, to answer one question that Roald Bass has been recovered. So well known for <laughs> And so then you have the CGC effective theory. Now, now the, the power of this approach is that you don't just write down this equation for just the two-point coordinate, you still can write for all endpoint coordinates. And so that's describing the sort of bands of these photons in transfer space okay, as, as this object evolves in the theory. And there's really a formal analogy <coughs> to a functional Foucault-Blanc equation, where you can think of rapidity as time, uh, and what you have on the right-hand side looks very much like, just like in configuration space, you have in color space partial derivatives, and then you have something like a diffusion coefficient in here. So this is really like a functional Foucault-Blanc equation. And what it's doing is really describing the diffusion of the fuzz of weak gluons in the functional space of color fields. So that's really, it's remarkable power of this framework in describing how the dipole scatters. And because it's a functional Fokker-Planck equation, every Fokker-Planck equation can be represented as a Langevin equation. Uh, and this Langevin equation can be solved numerically to the unit laws of inaccuracy. So this is really uh, extremely powerful. So let me now come to this uh, very specific calculation that I want to mention. Uh, and uh, this is work in progress with uh, Kalshay Koi, who's sitting here, uh, my student, his fourth year of PhD um, at Stony Brook. So the, the process that we want to describe is producing a photon and die jets in, in, in the A collision. So, so you have the nucleus, which is moving along E plus, in the X plus direction. And then you have the virtual photon, which is moving in this direction. So you have a large Q minus. Uh, where the virtual photon splits <coughs> into spark and color pair, scatters with a shockwave, and then emits a photon. Yeah. Now, these the gluon fields in this wave function satisfy the Agnos equations. Uh, and they, because this nucleus is highly Lorentz contracted, there's one large component, it's Lorentz contracting X minus, and there's a color charge density corresponding to a large X sources to keep these small X. So now if we were trying to do an explicit calculation, uh, the leading R term would be that of a quark scattering a virtual photon and then scattering off the E1 fields, but this term is small as suppressed because as I mentioned, the valence particles are, are hugely suppressed. So there's an X suppression. So the leading term really is where this, you have this quark and quark pair produced. And then you can have all possible insertions from both uh, from, from, from the gluons onto both the quark and the anti quark, where this blob represents all possible such coherent multiple scatterings, which are represented by this Wilson line here, going from minus uh, x minus and minus infinity to plus infinity times this uh, rho over delta per square, which comes from solving the angular equations. So this is a highly non trivial object. Uh, but that's what is in this blob. So this blob represents all possible such multiple scatterings. So now you can say, okay, let me now compute uh, um, this cross-section. And so this is a cross-section for Q 
QQ bar plus gamma and X, so this is inclusive. Uh, and you can write this in terms of, just like you hopefully fetch can shorter, you can write this in terms of your uh, matrix algebra squared. Uh, some of those things of list of these. Um, and this object in the IS can be written as LVU times X mu, where LVU is a left hand tensor. And X mu is a hadron tensor. So just like an inclusive DIS, um, but it's the hadron tensor for inclusive photon plus diagonal fraction. And this is what we compute. This is, of course, well known. Now, if you were to write down the leading order diagrams, then there's a, a number of combinations where you can have a photon being emitted <coughs> either before or after the scattering from either leg. Um, and then, or where the, the coherent scattering occurs in either the quark or the antiquark or both. Uh, and I'm going to, and so these, these are things that we computed, and this is actually described in this paper here. And you can see that, and, and I'm going to argue that actually it's this contribution that really is a dominant contribution, where both, I mean, this, this whole expression with a slight change can be rewritten in terms of entirely in terms of just these two diagrams. Now we'll mention that later. So the inclusive, um, the I, so the inclusive DIS photon plus jet cross section again can be written as L mu times X mu. And so here's now where you see some of the really interesting non trivial stuff, which is this hadron tensor can be written in terms of an expression due to those direct traces. But now you have these really no, novel objects which are represented by pi. And so in addition to the usual dipoles, which are these traces of those lines, which can be represented in this form here, where you go from x minus and minus infinity, plus infinity, go up and expert back again. Um, you also get novel quadrupole type configurations, which look like this. So these are really closed loops like that, which are now traces of four such Wilson lines. So these are very non-trivial objects, and so they encapsulate all this physics I was telling you about strongly correlated muons and hydrogens. So, so you can now ask, so we computed this explicitly, and you can ask, you know, what uh, are there some interesting limits? And indeed they are. So when you take the photon <coughs> momentum to zero, you, you can show that this amplitude satisfies the flow theorem, where the, the amplitude for production of photon and, and, and a quark and anti-quark, you want to take K and P, Q is the virtual photon momentum, can be split into a polarization vector times a vectorial structure, which only depends on the momentum emitted particles and the non-radiative DIS amplitude. Okay, so just this DIS amplitude without the photon. So and we can show that from our expressions, when we take this limit, we recover results that are well known in literature for diagenic production, okay, and which in some limit are again sensitive to the more white spectrum distribution. So that's all that's in, in our expressions. Uh, we can also show that if you take the <coughs> momentum exchange to be soft appropriately, uh, you can uh, you can or you ignore multiple scattering corrections or you, or you, they're subleading, you recover KT factorization and Kobe. So again, to answer Wolf, you recover actually the exact collinear factorization, the factorization goes to small x. <coughs> now, I come to you know the structure of doing high energy, uh, high order calculations. And so what I'm going to argue is that actually a lot of these calculations are done in light, in blind front quantization and in light front gauge. And that gives you tremendous intuition and so on. But so far, there's not a single calculation that's been done beyond quantum light of quantization. Problems multiply like crazy. Uh, even at one loop, if you want to do mass renormalization of heavy quarks, that problem has only been solved very recently. So it's a very non trivial problem. And so but I'm going to argue that it's really not necessary. Um, you can actually work in the wrong light cone gauge. Uh, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So the, light, the wrong light cone gauge is really the gauge which is opposite to the gauge where you describe PDFs, right? We can set the gauge links to, to read it. That's really not necessary in general if you're doing a general calculation, so we work in this. And so there's a tremendous simplification that occurs when you work in this wrong light cone gauge for propagators, these dressed propagators, quarks and muons, where you can write them as free propagators uh, and then just free propagators multiplied by these effective vertices, which are then Fourier transforms of these Wilson line correlators. So you can write down the expressions entirely in momentum space. You can just forget about coordinate space when you're doing these calculations. Okay. Uh, so that's 
that's something that I'll show uh, in a second. Uh, but there's also another really very interesting thing here is that the structure of these vertices are identical to the quark quark region of muon dome region vertices in the Pato's frequency field theory. So there's a very alternative uh, field theory formulation of the high energy limit due to the Pato and collaborators. And it was a very nice paper by Kinshinsky recently where he showed that this is exact equivalence between these propagators and the Pato and collaborators. So with that, then you can actually go and and do um, higher order calculations. And since no one has done this calculation before, we decided to do it, and also it's of great terminological interest, which is looking at inclusive photons plus digits at higher, higher orders. And specifically, we want to compute the analog impact factor for a photon plus digits. Now, there are two sorts of contributions here, and they're both formally at next to next to leading order. So they hold two loops. Uh, so let me first talk about this one here. So it's, it has two loops and gluons, but then there's also this quark, which, but it's produced on the shell, so it's not really a loop. Um, so sorry, the photon. Um, so when you look at this, this two loop computation, because you have a cut between large x and small x, effectively this object can be absorbed in the evolution of the wave function. While you here you're then doing just this, you're doing this NLO corrections to the to the uh, QP bar productions. Okay, so that's the stuff about the cut. Uh, and, and then this other NLO contribution, which is also two loops, it's order alpha squared, uh, involves a leading order impact factor here, but then you have a two-loop computation as well. So if I were to compute inclusive photon plus digit to NLO and next leading log accuracy. So then this would have a form which is the weight functional evolves to next leading log x times the leading order cross section, which is this thing here. And then there's a term which is leading log evolution here times the analog impact factor. And this whole thing can be rewritten as this object times this leading order plus analog impact factor up to alpha s squared accuracy. Okay, so specifically alpha s cubed. So when you go to alpha squared uh, accuracy, then you start, you will find that there are terms that here which are not fully included in the structure. Okay, but this is accurate up to this accuracy here. And this object is obtained by, from the analogical California. Okay, so this is a kernel which resums next to the log. So not just alpha log 1 over x, but also alpha squared log 1 over x corrections. And so this is now known. So the leading order Hamiltonian was computed 20 years ago, and this is now known uh, last uh, five years or so. Okay? So this is what we compute. Okay? So this is the computation that we did. And so um, it took us six months. It's almost done. So there'll be three papers appearing very soon. Uh, there was a lot of work done uh, in, in for the impact factor, and, and some of the people on this one listed here. All these calculations here for the impact factor are using light from perturbation theory, except for Usari and collaborators. Um, but um, so, uh, so, so, by our calculation, as I mentioned, is done like on page. It's all like on page. And so, there's, there's lots of contributions. Uh, so, there's real contributions, interference contributions. So, just vortex contributions, just in the amplitude, you have 24 terms, and self-energy corrections in the amplitude have 36 terms. So um, just to, uh, so yeah, so let me just uh, kind of summarize this quickly. So, um, so if you take the soft U1 limit, okay, of, of our expression, so the leading odd expression for Hadron tensor is some coefficient times this, uh, these, these, uh, these color factors here, but you take the soft gluon limit and you do the analog calculation, you get all kinds of complicated structures. You get, you get dipole, quadrupole, dipole, 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 quadrupole, and so on. It looks really messy. Now it turns out that if you take the soft gluon limit, you can write this beautifully as a term, which is, which is the Jim Will Hamiltonian acting on this yeah. object. Exactly. So using some, uh, I mean, it's sort of, it's along the same lines as what is shown here, but we actually did the explicit calculation of 
Fine diagram is getting this expression here. And you see merely that this leads to the dual RG equation for the evolution of the coordinates. So, this is a completely non trivial first principles derivation of the of the uh, of dual evolution for a very non trivial object involving things like quadrupoles. Uh, so, that's something really nice to see. So, I had the last part of my talk, but I'm going to skip it. It was about color memory. Uh, but I'm happy to talk to any of you about this. Uh, unfortunately, I ran out of time, and uh, my chairman is very happy, so I'm sure he's going to get So, so I guess about 15 years ago or more, when we were looking at dipole model and the era increaser. I of naive models to look at the data for very well. But what we found also, so you know, as you know, when you do that, the, 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 the question is is the data coming from the part where that dipole cross section is, 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 uh, is uh, consistent with the color transparency, which is also known as the low end, which is linearly right, or where are the or is it actually more up in this curve where it's getting saturated? And indeed, we found that those things were actually at the place where it's getting saturated. Did you, so, so, so we argued about this a lot, and, and the thing was very, very feasible. Do you, do you think now, having looked at this for, for a long time now, do you think, do you think that actually means that you saw some sort of saturation in that or not? Yeah, so, so when you uh, gave your talk, uh, I, I wanted to say something, but I thought I would say it in, in my talk here. I was glad you asked the question, actually. Um, because to me, the strongest evidence for saturation <coughs> today is, um, is the uh, the dependence of the refractive cross section. Actually, that was what I still remember Al Mueller in 2016, where you see that you know, sigma diffractive or sigma total. Mm -hmm. Uh, as a function of W for different masses, was flat. Yeah. And we still remember Al Mueller in the Yale cafeteria telling you this is saturation. Yeah. Right? And, and the, 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 the Golden and Bookstore model was in some sense really created to yeah. explain this phenomenon that you needed something yeah. to get quality to change. And there are all these non perturbative models, if you remember, on the market, they all died because it required an energy dependent <coughs> scale that, that turned things over. And I still think that that's true. And actually, we have done uh, latest HERA combined data shows that, that there's a real tension with the fractal PDFs below a GV squared. Sure. Okay, so that's the status is that there's a very significant tension. And the saturation models, you know, the more sophisticated variants, they do a great job describing that. And okay, it just comes out very nicely. It describes all the refractive data very nicely, all the systematics. Now, I mean, uh, you know, am I going to, you know, hang my hand on that? I'm not so sure because the scales are small, as I've mentioned, and so it feels so, uh, a little sure about that. So, so, so what, what, what does small scale in this? Because, as you know, things begin to kind of go awry for people that you know, evolution. <coughs> yeah, so at, at relatively high Q squared in the carrot. So, look at it really carefully. Right. So, so that's the other part of the story is that if you, you look at the uh, Canada PDF guys, uh, so there's a uh, recent paper by Rocco and Paul and others, not the old Canada PDF collaboration or subset, but they say that the, the most sophisticated analysis of the HERA combined data is consistent with small x distribution for the small x region. And it does better than the, the so, so if you have small x estimation, saturation is not very far away. Yeah. So, 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 so that's what's driving the rapid growth. But, but, but the argument is always, you know, where is the scale high enough to actually control the evolution? And, right. and how do you how do you actually settle this argument with where it is? So 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 okay, I'm really happy you're asking these questions because these are somewhat hit um, probably. So so let me say two things. One is that um, the it's not just the fact that the scale is large or small, is it energy dependent? Because it's very hard to come up with models where the scale is energy dependent. 
So there be, there were lots of models which had muon condensate type scales and instanton vacuum models and so on. If you remember, before, they all just couldn't describe these scales because it required an energy sensitive scale. So so the scale is indeed small and it's close to lambda to speed, right? So you saw it's you know optimistically on the order of 0.5 GeV. So it looks very precarious. Um, and so you would have to be really something precocious for that to be very robust. Um, the other thing though is that if you look at all the event generators in LHC data, you know, Pythia, EPOS, they all put in a saturation scale. They don't call it a saturation scale. They have to put in an energy dependent semi hard scale of several GV to describe the LHC data. Okay. So to me, that, that's, you know, that's telling you that if you cannot understand basic systematics of multi particle production without putting in an energy dependent scale. Now, the origins of this energy dependent scale we're going to debate where it comes from, you know, which is the correct framework that describes that. But these are semi hard scales, it's not lambda QCD. So you ask yourself why would the LSC data, the bulk LSC data, everything that you describe there in soft physics, require a scale of several GV. Where does that come from? Why is it energy? So I, I guess I'm trying to get at. Yeah. You know, so so I went through many many years of arguments about whether it be salt saturation or not salt saturation in agile, and there was a lot of meetings where we discussed this a lot. Uh, and, and and the question is, you know, what is it about EIC that's going to settle this? Well, like I mentioned, the the, the scale is significantly larger. And, and so you should yes, see that's true, yeah. but, but, but yeah. you know, so there is a there is a continuum, I guess. It's yeah. the square root of 0.5, square root of 10, say. So this and, is not and Q squared, it's Q S, right? It's yeah, Q sub S, which is, but you need to reach that, that Q sub S at a particular X, right? right? right. And, and so, 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 you know, there's always an argument. They said, well, you know, the Q sub S kind of low, you see R the effects. That, but my claim is that the MCs are, are very small. You see, you see systematic A squared, you know, the dependencies in terms of A and Q squared at, occurring at semi hard values of QF, uh, Q, which are dramatic. And you sure. see that, uh, you know, you're, you can try and come up with an alternative explanation, but it's, it would be very strong. So it is as a diffraction. Yes. Yes, so the fact cross section will be huge. There is no yeah. other explanation. Right. So, para diffraction yeah. cross section. Right. And the and, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, cross section. Right. You know, other than this kind of dipole. Yes. No. There's no other one. No. Right. Well, well, that didn't settle the argument. What I said is that my point is that you can parameterize that physics in terms of diffraction EPS uh, at para. Mm -hmm. But as I said, there's a significant no. tension. So, so, okay, so, so, so yes, I, I claim that the practice media doesn't actually tell you anything. I agree with you. Yes, I totally agree with you. And also, I mean, there are, I'm just saying that if I would play the devil's advocate, yeah, yeah, right? Exactly. If I were to play the devil's advocate, I could say, I mean, so for example, I've had arguments with Mark Strickman, and Mark would say, oh, there's diffractive the PDFs, you know, collinear factorization works, even though it's very hard to think of collinear factorization in such a dense read that it's telling you that stuff is going up. But okay, let's take it for, as fake, you know, face value. The factor PDFs, the factor PDFs factorization, it, it's having huge tensions, and and you have so much freedom there to play with parameters, right? Because it's, it's this was part of why I asked the question about that. In the end, it is true that I yeah. think if you look at the mix of variables, you look at a and x and the q square. Now, essentially, the, what you get out of the dipole cross section <coughs> is just can be much different than anything else you do, because it's always that evolution of the dipole. I think it's probably true. You need a mix of observables of A, X, and Q squared, and then it's the only way to settle it. But, but, but my, I think the good news, though, is that you, you, can yeah. rule, you can rule in, in, in and out very quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, you know, I can go and work on something else very quickly. Well, it'll be 65 by then. But Okay, okay. Well, let's not talk about your, your retirement plans. So, so if you want well, to continue our time, we have some right. discussion space in the afternoon. If you want to need another so, so small discussion, you're very welcome. Yeah, so it sounds like you have something to say on the issue or you could
just completed uh, franchise government tax. Yeah, no, I think one question from the point of separation and era data. Uh, do you think uh, there could be a difference between uh, the work and rules or in terms of uh, so work typos, respect uh, to typos? Uh, do you think that the difference from the point of view of separation scale? So, so, so I think that the, so you, so the, of course, both are interacting in statutory review, but you're asking whether it's a quark or a gluon dipole. So, in a gluon dipole, of course, coupling is stronger because it's a strong color factor um, of many folds. Um, so the problem with gluon dipole, which is so in PA collision, so I can, a lot of my work right now is studying PA physics in the LDC, trying to describe that in these kind, of, these kind of frameworks. The problem there, of course, is that then it's more messy as well, right? So there's multiple, it's complicated final states. And higher order calculations are even harder. But, um, but the answer is yeah, I mean, yes, it's, it's actually in principle a stronger effect. Uh, and you're thinking that a, a signal for, for your favorite signal for saturation in here would become a fraction. In that case, uh, fraction is, uh, is uh, much more dominated by one channel. Yeah, that's why I said it goes as a cross section squared, right? So it's one minus, there was a one minus this one squared. You see, it's a very dramatic effect. And in meeting twist, it's a gluon distribution squared. So it's not sensitive to gluon distribution, it's gluon distribution squared. So it's, it should be precocious. Okay, uh, Christoph. Yeah. yeah, I was thinking, I mean, concerning diffraction, for instance, the double different variance and so on. The, there are also some people who interpret it more, you know, as soft interruption, saying that if the function is dominated by soft gluon exchange, then it would be natural because if the, the soft gluon exchange doesn't depend too much on the R process, which is more proton, proton like. So we have that there, there needs to be also a way to distinguish between the soft exchange, which happen at a much longer time scale, than the proton like uh, exchange, which uh, happens at the very uh, the upper level. I would say so. This is so, so when you say soft in non uh, non quark and gluon interaction, it's a so loss of gluon. Basically, the, there is the hard interaction, which was your so, single gluon. So, so, I talk about the distinction between hard and soft, exactly. Yeah, 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 so in the soft armor, yeah, 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 not, not completely, but right. what I was thinking is more the, the hard gluon to produce jets or photon, right. whatever you want, right? And then there is just color screening, uh, screening with right. another soft gluon which is emitted at a longer right. time scale, right. which it gives you a diffracted event because there is a colorless exchange uh, at the end. Right. So, but it's uh, completely different if the, the two gluon exchange occurs already at the bottom level. Let's say so the Pomeron exchange. Whereas this one is a much longer time scale to, to screen color. Oh, so I see what you're saying. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Um, well, uh, okay, I mean, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. That actually describes um, the physics is another question. If the point I would make though in regard to Terra is that the striking thing is, you know very well, is that you see this, this flatness of the cross sections with pretty large and varying masses, yes. right? And, and it's hard to think that this additional soft exchange is playing a big role for such hard and very fast. Yes. And, and also so, related to saturation, I was wondering yeah. if the, the fact to compare, I mean, with different ions would be also crucial. Because if you can do ratio, oh. and, I mean, if you go use lead, gold, or lighter, ion, that's that's okay. that's that's my, that was my that's point. That's that the independence is very strong. Yes. Okay, okay. Christoph, you're eating up your own problem. <laughs> <laughs> and ultimately, into the coffee break. So I apologize, no more questions. Uh, we'll consider we, the organizers, consider to have a discussion space in that room. Maybe we'll have a small discussion about evidence of saturation and the uh, potential of the case. So, if I can just make one last remark. So, there's the last part of my talk that we get a chance to talk about. Please look at the slides and be happy to talk to you about it. We have a discussion session. Okay, it's not really relevant. Right. Okay, so let me put up some slides. I always put up on IMT website, and yeah. there's also a video of this which will be put on the YouTube channel. Uh, <coughs> All right, let's thank the speaker again.